today we're going to be covering a couple of subjects. One is, what does it mean for the husband to be the head of the wife? And then my wife will be covering, what is the responsibility of a wife? What is her right. job title, you might say, right? Right, the azar, the revealer of the enemy. Okay, so I'll start first, but before we do, let's, uh, let's bow our head in prayer here. Father, we come to you this morning. We know just how important the subject of marriage is and, and the guidelines that you have given us in your love that if we followed, we would, we would have the type of marriage that, that you designed for all of us. So we're going to come and share the things that Claudia and I have learned over the past 20 years with this group of people. And we just ask that you would open up the hearts of the men here to be able to hear what's going to be discussed today and also the heart of the wives because what we have to say is so important. And if we don't understand uh, this vital part of what are the roles of the husband and wife, we will never have the marriage that you designed. So I just pray for your help today, that you would guide and you would direct what we have to say. And we just want to uh, place this whole session now in your hands, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as I was saying earlier, that we are going to, I'm going to start first and cover what is the role of the husband being the head of the wife and what that means and what that entails. But before we begin, I want to brush up on what we covered in the last session, section six. If you remember, we covered the deceitfulness of the flesh. We've got a little ring going on here, a little to tone. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'll move out of the way. we'll work out the details. So what we learned last session was the deceitfulness of the flesh. And if you remember in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, you don't have to turn there, but I want you to remember what we covered. Remember the scripture says, the flesh or the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Remember, as we went through that, the flesh is deceitful. Remember, we saw how it would, it would even lie to you, it would trick you, it would tell you things that weren't true and convince you to do things uh, that were totally wrong. And desperately wicked. Remember, we covered the word desperately. That means it was weak, almost dead. It was it was to the point where you couldn't even revive it. It's so desperately weak. And it was wicked. Wicked means totally against God. Everything that was about God, it was against. So the heart was deceitful and desperately wicked. And who can know it or who can understand it? Remember, we covered that. And the reason I wanted to rehearse that or go back over it again, because it's so important that we keep that scripture in mind as we go into what it means to be, for the husband to be the head. It's very important that we keep that scripture in mind. Well, let's go to Ephesians 5 to begin with, if you have a Bible, Ephesians 5, because this explains... where the husband is to be the head. All right, I know where you're here. Ephesians 5. Where did I go here? I added my little thing. <laughs> it's after Galatians, I know that. Ephesians 5, and we're going to begin in verse 21, because Paul is starting here in this particular part of this chapter, he's, he's, he's going to be explaining some instructions about marriage. So if we begin in verse 21, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I mean, you won't hear this scripture read too much in too many churches where 
he's talking to both the husband and the wife, and he's explaining to them that they are to submit themselves one to another. You're, you're to submit to each other's strengths. My wife has strengths that I don't have, and I have strengths that she doesn't have. And we are to learn how to submit ourselves one to another, to submit not to our weaknesses, but submit to our strengths. I'm, I'm real good at making the money. She's real good at spending the money. <laughs> <laughs> Organizing the money. Yeah. She's real good at financing or uh, controlling it. Now, and I spend money like a drunken sailor. So I make the money my wife, I give her, I submit to her because she controls it. Okay, so that's kind of how it works. We need to submit to each other's strength is what this is talking about. Verse 22, this is another scripture that is sometimes misrepresented. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, a lot of times, you know, men have used this to kind of beat their wives up about submitting to them. But if you look at the word, their own. Submit to your own husbands. You want to circle that. Because Paul was addressing something that was going on in that day and age where all women were are subject to men. It was just the way the society was at the time. So Paul was addressing to new Christian wives that, hey, you don't have to submit to every man that's out there. You're only to submit to your own husband. Now, verse 23 is the one I wanted to jump to. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So this is where we first hear or that, that the husband is the head of the church, or head of his wife. But there's another scripture here I want us to read as well. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Let me just interject while he's looking for the scripture. Uh, our next session, we're going to add address the whole submission respect issue in detail so he just kind of blew over that uh, right now because later we'll do that the the other subject okay we want to go to first corinthians 11 and verse 3 but i would have you to know that the head of every man is christ and the head of the woman or the husband is the man and the head of christ is god so what we're being discussed here is a series of responsibilities, okay? Christ is the head of the man, the man is the head of the wife, and God is the head of Christ. So it's a, it's a, a, a position of responsibility. So those are the two scriptures that, that, that tell us that the, that the man is the head. But how did that originally start? Where did that come from? Well. You have to go to Genesis 3 to see where that came about. So let's turn over to Genesis 3. Genesis 3 and verse 6. Now, I don't want to go over the whole thing, the whole situation in the Garden of Eden. You all know what happened. Eve got deceived and the husband went along with her and they both ate the apple and because they are ate the, the fruit so they both received a curse okay so here's what the curse is going to be genesis 3 100 and verse 16. under the woman he said i will greatly multiply in thy sorrow and thy conception and in sorrow shall you bring forth your children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over you. So that was, that was Eve's curse, that she would, be, he would be, she would be ruled over by her husband. Well, you might wonder, well, why was that a curse? Why was it a curse for her husband to rule over her? Well, because the husband, being a very mechanical person, he's not into relationships at all, he actually didn't know anything on how to deal with his wife. And where before the fall, Eve was getting her, her uh, value, value and, acceptance. and acceptance from God, because of the curse, she was now going to have to go to her husband for that. And her husband wasn't going to be able to give it to her because he didn't know anything about that, being a, such a mechanical man and not being any relational. And then after the fall, he became selfish. 
There was yeah. no Christ-likeness or God-likeness in him, so we're now dealing with the selfish man. So what I wanted to point out is that when they both fell, uh, let me put it this way. Their factory settings got changed. You know, when you buy a TV, it always says that there's a factory setting and it defaults to factory setting if something goes wrong. Well, originally, both Adam and Eve, their factory setting was being, was uh, focused on God. But when they both fell, when they sinned, their factory setting got changed in a way, as you might say. And so their factory setting now was going to be focused on the flesh. It was all going to be flesh focused now. So the curse was going to be now with, with Adam's going to rule his wife, he's going to be ruling her in the flesh. That's what happens with most men. They rule their wives in their flesh. Well, that's what you see in the world. That's yeah. what's going on in the world. And God calls us out of the world to live a different way of life. So he's trying to get us back to the original factory setting, you might say. So what does ruling, the, uh, ruling in the flesh look like? Because that's the way where most men struggle with, is they rule in the flesh. And when the flesh is all selfish, it's all self-centered, when a man makes decisions because he's, he's, his factory setting is flesh, he's going to make decisions that only satisfy what he's looking for. So most of his decisions are going to be selfish. He's going to make sexual demands, just the way men are. He's going to be prideful because he's, he's focused on his own self, on his pride. So he doesn't want his wife to do or say anything to him that's going to embarrass him or, or to insult him. And so he'll be very prideful. It's, it's kind of like Satan is the one that reset the TV set or the stereo system or whatever. Yeah. He set it to this. So God is, with his spirit and with Jesus as our example, is trying to get us back to the original factory setting, which is opposite of that. Now, you remember this? I handed it out last time we were here. The, what roads. road are you on today? The two roads. And I told the men, you know, take this home and put it on your refrigerator door and look at it every morning when you go down to have your coffee. And so you can decide which road are you going to walk that day. Now, I won't have, have you show hands of how many put that on their refrigerator. But... I just want you to say, I just want to tell you right now that if your wife saw you put this up on the refrigerator, it would have made her heart sore to see that you cared enough as a husband to want to make the changes that are necessary to learn how to love her as God would love her and not love her in the flesh. So she noticed whether or not you put it up. She's also going to notice if you didn't put it up. She's gonna, if she saw that you didn't put it up anywhere where you could look at this, she's going to feel bad about it. She's going to realize that, hey, my, maybe my husband is not all that serious about this. I mean, this could be still folded up in your Bible where you put it in when you left the last time I gave the message. So it's important that we show to our wives that we're, as husbands, we want to make the effort that we need to in order to be a Christ-like leader in their life. But this whole list that you see here, there's probably 25 items on what leading in the flesh looks like. I could take all the time here to go through each one of those, and I may just take a, a little more time here on a few of the issues. But the point I want to make is I didn't get these, this list here of, of the fleshly actions of the flesh out of a book. This was stuff that I wrote down after doing a self examination of myself to see what I was doing and when I was trying to lead my wife. So th this is a very personal list that I handed out to you. And you know, you have your own list, you guys, you men. And you need to make a list of it to see, well, how is it that you're ruling your wife? When, because you are going to be ruling her in your flesh if you're not making an effort to rule her in Christ-likeness.
I ruled my wife by protecting my own ego. I ruled my wife by being entitled. I felt that, uh, hey, I was the man. I felt I was the boss, because that's what the world says. The man's the boss, so I have the right to make any decision I want. I, I can be entitled. I made those decisions in the flesh. I was resentful to her. That's how I ruled her, was with, with, is with resentment a lot of the times. I was insensitive to her. I ruled her with insensitivity. I didn't really care what she thought. I didn't care what, what was wounding her or hurting her. I was making decisions based on my flesh, the things that I felt were right, that I wanted uh, done because I was the boss and this is the way I wanted it to be and I didn't care how it affected her. I ruled her in anger. I, because, you know, when I got angry, she, she scrambled. She went and hid. And to me, being in the flesh, that gave me power. I knew if I just showed a little anger, she'd, she'd take off. And, 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 you know, run from me because she was fearful of me when I get, would get angry. But I used that as a, as a weapon against her. Well, in essence, Satan used it. Yeah. He used my husband as a weapon against me because when I get into the revealer of the enemy, the Azar, this was the perfect way to shut down the revealer of the enemy because he, Satan was using, we've talked about dark rooms in the past, the very essence of who I was was the fear of being abandoned. The fear if I wasn't good enough, right enough, special enough, pleasing enough, that I would be abandoned. And that ran my life for years. And Satan knew how to run my life and he knew how to shut me down. And so he would use his anger and my flesh. his flesh to shut the revealer down. That was your weakness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Yep. Your Achilles heel. It's always the Achilles heel he goes after. I ruled her with my arrogance. I thought because I was a man, my, my perspective was always correct. <laughs> One time in class, uh, with, when we were learning this stuff, I, uh, I had a conversation with, with the leader. And, and I told him, you know, my wife uh, doesn't agree with me sometimes, and I need her to agree. I need her to submit to my position. <laughs> and he says, well, what makes you think you're right? Well, because I'm the man. I'm entitled. <laughs> was my, that was my perspective. I thought, I, because I thought of it, then it must be correct. You and said, she must be wrong. My perspective is always right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, come a long way, haven't uh, I? Yes. <laughs> yes. I ruled her with unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. You know, when she did something that offended me, Again, I felt I had power over her because she wanted to be forgiven and I held that over her head. I controlled her through my, I ruled her with my flesh through unforgiveness. I was very controlling. Again, very controlling because I was always in my flesh. I felt that she needed to obey me. She needed to do what I told her to do. And when she didn't, I had took great uh, resentment from that. I was revengeful when she would do something to me. Again, out of my flesh, I would react to her, and I'd do something revengeful. Well, it was his perception that I was doing something terrible because I was only doing my job revealing the enemy to protect the family, and he saw it as uh, impeding his fun. Yeah. I was a fun sucker, you know, yeah. basically. <laughs> I was very judgmental to my wife. I ruled her by being very judgmental. I would look t to see what she was doing and if she didn't do things properly or the way I thought it should be done, I was judging her. I was very judgmental. I condemned her, I was despiteful, I was degrading. And in all of that, it shut me down, made me sick, and created a, a people pleaser. I became an unbelievable people pleaser for everybody and uh, eventually became very, very sick and 
it, it began the journey to repair my life. It was between God and I. It did, his behavior did definitely throw me into the arms of God because I was spent a lot of time on my knees. Well, like I said, I, I controlled her through my flesh. That was why it was a curse to her for me to be her head because I was controlling her or leading her or ruling her in the flesh instead of Christ-likeness. You know, when I was baptized, I went under the water, like we all did, and the old flesh man died. And Hopefully. when I came up, Hopefully. that was how, what was supposed to happen. <laughs> when I came up out of the water, I was supposed to be a new creation. I was supposed to be a Christ man. When I was baptized, the flesh man was to die. And the, the, when I came up, then the Christ man was supposed to take over. And my, my life from that point forward was to imitate Christ in everything. As a Christian man, that was my responsibility, was to lead my wife like Christ would lead her in everything. But for, but for the first 30 years of my marriage, I continued to rule my wife in the flesh, even after baptism. I did it because nobody explained any of this to me. Well, and so I continued to, to go ahead. I was, go ahead. I was going to say, you, you thought that if you just kept the Sabbath for the holy days, yeah. didn't eat pork and pay your tithes, be, be a deacon, give a sermon up here and there, you were I was good, good to go. You were good to go. Yeah. And so. But I continued to rule her in the flesh. And I thought I had God's blessing because after all, Scripture says I'm the head. So I thought I had got God's blessing this whole time. But you know, God takes notice of how we rule. Now, if you ever read the book of uh, First and Second Kings, there's a whole list of what God has, has written down and recorded on the kings of Israel, on whether they ruled righteously or if they ruled in an overbearing, evil way. And he not only recorded their names, but he recorded the dates or how much time they spent in that position. Well, I spent the first 30 years not being a good ruler in my kingdom. I ruled her through my flesh, which was a horrible thing for her to have to put up with. But in ignorance, that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Well, the, class, the classes I took 20 years ago at Christ Quest Institute taught me what Christ-like rulership really is supposed to look like. Being the head of my wife doesn't mean being the boss. You know, and I thought that was what it meant. If you're the head, you're the boss. I mean, that's, that's how society has trained the men to believe, that if you're the man, you're the boss. That's incorrect. Well, it's not just society, it's churches. Yeah. Religion was, I'm not saying God or the Bible was damaging. Religion was damaging, and I see it throughout all religions in the world. It's very damaging to the role of the woman and misrepresenting the role of the man. So being the boss is not what that scripture means to be the head. What it really means is being the responsible one. When you're the head of something, you're the responsible one. You're the one that has to give an account for the condition of whatever it is that you're overseeing. That's what the head means. Not that you just get to be the boss and make decisions and, and be selfish and, make, and do things that are all about yourself. It's about being responsible. Remember the scripture we just read where, where uh, God is responsible for Christ? Christ is responsible for the husband? and the husbands are responsible for their wives. So it's a, being the head means being responsible, the responsible one who has to make, give an account for the condition of his marriage. Now, I kind of help you see this, this story. The picture you're going to a job site and something has gone wrong on the job site. So the owner of the company, he goes down to the job site to see what happened. Well, who does he go to? 
He doesn't go to the workers who made the mistake. He goes to the foreman, the person who was in charge. It's the person who is in charge, the responsible one, the foreman, who is the one who has to give an account to the owner of the company of why this happened. Now, the foreman may not be personally responsible because he didn't actually do whatever it was that was wrong, but because he was the head, because he was the foreman, he was responsible to correct the problem. And he's the one that had to give an answer to whatever took place at that job site. And we, as husbands, are basically in the same position. God has placed us husbands as the head to rule over our wives. But we have to rule them, not in our flesh, but in, but like in Christ-likeness. And if there's a problem in the marriage, it's the husband's responsibility to figure out what went wrong and what can I do to fix it. Like I said, he may not be 100% responsible or 100% at, at, fault. at fault for what happened, but he's 100% responsible because he has been put in the headship over his wife. It's very important for a man to understand that. Well, then it reminds them of the scripture that you have to love your wife as Christ loved the church. Exactly, gave Ephesians 5, for again. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And that Christ is responsible to bring the church to a place of without spot or wrinkle. That's right. He has to correct anything that's, that, that the wife is struggling with. He has to present his wife without spot or wrinkle. So as the head of the, his wife, he has to look at the spiritual condition of his wife, see where she things that she struggles with, and instead of beating her down and <laughs> ruling her in the flesh, we're to rule her as Christ would rule her and help her and help her to reach her full, her full potential in every aspect of her life because he's the head, he's the overseer. Well, what does a, husband, uh, what does a husband's Christ-like rule look like? We just saw what the flesh looks like, it's not pretty. <laughs> well, what does a husband's Christ-like rule really look like? Well, it can go back to our little list here again that we handed out last week that is still folded up in your Bible somewhere. <laughs> and try to dra drag it, dr bring it out, and let's go over it. This, this is the side that says God's rule. How does, uh, God's road, I mean. This is the road that we are supposed to walk. This is the Christ-likeness road that we as husbands, Christian husbands, are to walk. A Christ-like husband will be considerate to his wife and at all times, considerate of her. You have to look and see what's going on in her life and, and what is happening to where you can be considerate of some of the things that maybe she's, that happened that day or that week. And, and the things that trouble her, we, we, you're to be considerate of the things that are troubling her. We're to rule her as, in, in kindness, as if Christ was ruling her himself. In kindness, not to be short-tempered or anger, angry, but we're to be kind to her. We're, we're to rule her in thoughtfulness. We need to help her out. You know, a wife, you, we, uh, us men, we don't really realize the things that happen or what the wife has to go through during the day, the things that she struggles with, and we need to help them out once in a while. You know, take the, take the load off. Wash the dishes for her once in a while. I know it's a sacrifice. I can speak for that. Maybe vacuum the house. Do something that would, that would uh, be thoughtful to her, to be considerate of her. We need to rule her with encouragement, not criticalism or a critical spirit. Because that's how I ruled when I was in the flesh. It was critical. It wasn't encouraging. So as a Christ-like man, I want to continue to encourage her. I need to respect her. I need to rule her with respect. You know, she is the queen of my kingdom. And I need to teach, I, I need to, to treat her as such. And a lot of times men don't realize 
that they're being disrespectful to their, to their wives. But that's our job, that's our Christian responsibility as the head as, of the, as being the husband and the head of our wife is to rule them as Christ would rule them. When my wife looks at me, she should be able to see Christ. I know that's, that's a big I pair of shoes to have to wear. I didn't used to. <laughs> oh, of course. I mean, I represented Satan most of the time, not Christ-likeness. So we need to r remember that as husbands, we have a huge responsibility in God's eyes to represent him in everything that we do in our life, in our, in our marriages, or with our family. We need to rule with understanding and not be dismissive. I mean, how many times as a husband, when I was ruling her in my flesh, was I dismissive of her? I wasn't understanding with the things that she struggled with or that she wanted help with. I just dismissed her, deal with it. He would always say, you live in a world of awfulism. Well, as it was not even helping me, you know, what is awfulism? Anyways, I was, yes, I had lots of things in my salad bowl, many, many things in my salad bowl that he would dismiss it. We need to rule our wives in tenderness, not in gruffness. You know, when I was in the flesh, I was gruff with my wife. We're to rule our wives in tenderness. Yes, we're to rule them. God has put us in the position of ruling them. But we have to rule them in a way that is Christ-like. What wife would have a problem being ruled by her husband if he was always Christ-like in his behavior? Which wife would be insubordinate? Which wife would argue and, and, and not go along with the husband if he was Christ-like in, in his behavior toward her? We need to rule our wives with forgiveness. And we need to be quick to forgive. You know, if our wives did something that upset us, we need to be quick to forgive because Christ was quick to forgive. God is quick to forgive. We need to have a caring heart. We need to rule our wives with a caring heart. We need to be loving to our wives. We rule them in love, like it says. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's agape love. Remember we discussed that? Agape love. It's a self-sacrificing love. Self-sacrificing. So that's how we are to rule our wives. I know the the curse can be broken that the wife has to endure. The curse that was given in the garden where it says your husband will rule over her, over her. That, that curse, because it was a curse, remember, because he was going to rule her in his flesh. But a man can break that curse on his wife by learning how to rule her in Christ's likeness. In Christ's likeness. And it works. Mm -hmm. I've been living that way for 20 years now. I've, 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 I made a, a promise to my wife that I would be the Christ-like husband that God wanted me to be. And I've really put my effort into it. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes still. But you know when I make the mistake, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I can't just chalk it off as, oh, well, I need to repent of that and go back and do it again and do it right and, and really mirror and image Christ as a leader of my wife. Well, I can attest he definitely has changed in 20 years. And because of it, I've blossomed and I've been pulled out from that rock that I was shoved under. The tape's been off my mouth and every year, I've gotten better and I have healed and uh, mentally and emotionally and physically. And this is the blessing, this is the intention God had from the beginning that there would not be a rule or, or domination. It's, you know, men in the world dominate. There's, yeah. You see it in a varying degrees throughout the world. And, and you can uh, take a, just one look at a woman and know whether she's right. being Christ led or whether she's being dominated. Right. She's. It's a sad-looking person, 
You know, they, it's like they got tape over their mouth. Well, it go, it's, they, a, it's they, a pendulum they, swing, yeah, though. Yeah. You could either have the sad looking person or the beaten down looking woman or whatever, or it moves into rebellion and ab absolute, you know, women's lib, you might say, type of thing. It just, the pendulum just swings way to the other side, which is not God's way. So just to finish up, man, I just want you to remember the one thing here, if you can, is that we are to rule our wives, but we're not to rule them in our flesh. We're to rule them as Christ would rule them. So remember that the next time you get in a situation with your wife where you want to slip back to your, fa your factory setting <laughs> of being in the flesh, because that's where we go every time. We default back to the factory setting of being in the flesh. We'll go to that, that scripture about that uh, in Revelation, Christ will rule them with a rod of iron. That's yeah. actually pretty interesting because we think of him as you know, this rod of iron and he's gonna break their legs and make them bow and you know, this type of thing. Yeah, well, if you look up the word rule there, and it it's actually means to shepherd. It means to shepherd as a as a shepherd with a staff would 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 look oversee his sheep, and even this even the rod of iron is actually a staff. It's a, sh a shepherd's staff, it's, you know. And <laughs> it's not what we we thought or were taught. So sometimes you could read these things or have somebody uh, give a, a sermon or or whatever, and they're yeah. oh they're gonna in in Revelation they're gonna rule with a rod of iron, and you picture this un -Christ like Christ, you know, beating people, breaking their legs with this rod of iron, and it's none of that. None. Well, God does punish. He does, yeah. he does, there's a time for punishment, but when the punishment is over, he's going to lead them as a shepherd leads a sheep. You know, he's not going to take his staff and beat the sheep. <laughs> the, the rod is of iron, and, it, and it's amazing. If you look up the word iron, it's different than steel. Steel is bendable. It's strong, but it's bendable and pliable. But iron is very, uh, has strong integrity. That's why they make engine blocks out of iron and not steel, because it's so, it's so rigid, but in a, in a good way, in strength and, and, and integrity. Well, an engine block keeps the engine keeps from it together. Yeah. disintegrating okay. on you, so. Yeah, so we've had some, We've had a lot of wrong ideas brought on us men, taught by not only the world, but some of the things the church, un unfortunately, at least in my case, didn't fully explain to me that, that, yeah, I'm to be a ruler, I'm to rule my wife, but they never really explained to me what that looks like. And so, because I went off with only half the information or not enough information, I ruled her in my flesh instead of ruling her as Christ would rule her. So that, that covers the role of the husband. I hope that's more clear in everybody's mind what it means. It's, you're not just the boss. You're not the boss. You're the responsible one. Okay, now Claudia is going to cover... Well, I, I the hate wife. the word rule. <coughs> I know. It doesn't have good it, it connotations. It almost sounds negative. It does. It? it doesn't have good connotations. It, we can look out in the world and you can, you can look at, we can name all kinds of religions right down to Sharia law. That, yeah. that, is, that is ruling with such domination that it's, a satan the wrong kind it's of satanic rule. from yeah. my point of view. But uh, I just wanted to reiterate something from last time, which was about the, uh, knowing about the countenance, because this is all, we're, we're going to take you around in a circle so we could pull around the stuff from the beginning as we go along on the journey. But we have to remember that the countenance is what reveals to my husband what's going on inside of me. So no matter if I'm shut down, I'm still revealing if he was paying attention. If I was, during my days of shutdownness, <laughs> if there's such a word, uh, I was still revealing. You can't help not you can't not not, you cannot not reveal yeah. but um, anyways th this is all about having a spirit to spirit relationship and we need to keep that in in mind um, Genesis 2:18 I have to read it in his Bible because mine is like the novel the novel yeah. <laughs> and 
getting there. Oh, the pages. I know, they stick together. Okay, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. Well, people over the years have thought the word helpmeet means I'm just uh, his helper. I do the laundry, I do the washing, I do the cooking, I do the cleaning, I do the shopping, I take care of the kids, I do all of these physical things. Except, unfortunately, in the Garden of Eden, there, there wasn't the kitchen, and there wasn't the washing machine, and there wasn't the errands to run. No closed iron. So the word help me means izar kenigdu, and I don't have um, the Hebrew for that. Well, that is the Hebrew, izar kenigdu. And in the ancient Hebrew word pictures, it means a helper, suitable, or revealer of the enemy. So God created woman to be a helper that is suitable for the man, and I am the revealer of the enemy. All of you women are the revealer of the enemy, whether you knew you were or knew you weren't, it just is what it is. And in the ancient Hebrew word pictures, it shows a head, it shows an ax, and it shows an eye. And I've always thought, and some of you are too young to know this, or maybe you heard the term, when men say derogatorily, and I remember this as a kid, she's just an old battle axe. I don't know if you remember that statement, but she's just an old battle axe. And when I learned this Hebrew word pictures, I thought, well, that's really interesting because she is. <laughs> she is. She's to battle a, the she's enemy. She's to battle the enemy. And so the revealer of the enemy, the Izar, is the, the, the head, the axe, and the eye. And so in other words, I basically have his back. You're looking I forward. see his back. I see what's going on behind him. And with my battle axe, with my axe, what I'm seeing is I need to reveal the enemy. The enemy is his flesh. The enemy is Satan. The enemy is the world. And it always has to do with relationships. Because remember, women are relational. I'm not mechanical. I'm in the relationship world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm revealing, all women are revealing when there is a problem in relationships, like I would say to him, I know what's going on in the family. I know what's going on in the extended family because that's what we do. We have our ear to the door, the, we're ear to the crack of the door, and we're listening to everything that all the kids say and all the grandkids say. And so I would say to him when they were younger and living in the house, you know, we're, I don't know, I'm noticing, you know, one of the kids is having this problem at school or whatever, and he, they could use your help, they could use your input type of thing, because I'm always looking. Mm -hmm. And there were times, and he shared those times when he was very, very down on our youngest son's haircuts and stuff like that, and I could see that that was wounding his spirit and that this was not a good thing because, frankly, hair grows. So don't ruin the relationship over hair, over a style that's only going to last for a year or whatever. So I would go to him and tell him these things long before I even knew that this is what I was doing. And what I learned only validated, like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we all do that. We all are looking at for well, the that's enemy. that's your factory setting, is right. to be the revealer. I'm, my factory <laughs> setting is to be the revealer, and of course it's kind of like a curse because well, he was... In my flesh. In his flesh, he wasn't going to listen. I didn't want to hear her revealing he, anything. He was me. accusing me of being um, meddling, and I was... Domineering. Domineering, yeah. and I was bossy, and I was, you know, you name all the things that he did over there. Um, but anyways, to reveal the enemy is like we're like a gas gauge in a car. And none of us would ever in our right mind rip out the gas gauge because, well, we're going to take this trip, you know, through Death Valley, you know, go from California to Arizona, go through Death Valley because we want to see that wonderful national park, but we don't need that gas gauge. Let's yeah. just rip that gas gauge out. We don't even know how much gas we've got. We don't know if we're going to make it. The gas gauge there is to help us, it's to protect us, to, to gate, to to be a gauge for us to get from point A to point B and not break down. And it has to be accurate. And it has to be accurate. Yep. So if you're pulling it out, or the red light, the uh, the red light early warning sign uh, for a motor that be beeps and blinks on a dashboard, what one of us would rip that out? I mean, we'd be crazy to rip that out. Like, we don't want to know 
what's happening it's in annoying. the motor. It's annoying, which is what he at. would say. I was annoying. <laughs> she was I was annoying me. Uh, na I was nagging. I, you know, all of these not good things. Um, a smoke detector that we have in our house that makes terrible noise, but it's there to warn us that something is going that we can't see, that uh, that maybe we can't detect or smell, but the smoke alarm is there and it goes off. Or what about our seat belts? Same thing. If you don't hook that seatbelt up, that thing is ding, ding, dinging. And it's ding, ding, dinging to remind you to put that seatbelt on because it doesn't want you to fly through the windshield if you get into an accident. So this is what God did in, in a relationship, that he was to care for me, he was to give me value and acceptance. And in his flesh, being unchristlike, that was a, that was a curse because I couldn't get it. I couldn't get from him the very essence of what I needed and I'm trying to do my job, my role as a woman, which is the czar, the revealer of the enemy, and he wasn't having any of it. He wasn't listening. So it turned me into a screaming, hmm. nagging, uh, contentious woman. I was just a screaming, nagging, contentious woman because I'm doing my job. You're trying to warn me but and I'm not nobody, listening. he's not listening to me. And he just kept shutting me down and shutting me down. And I had to see our family go over the cliff so many times with decisions that he was making, and he would not consider my input. Um, the enemy, I mean, Satan is there in the family. Uh, society is there in the fi family. Uh, work is there in the family. All of these things impact this relationship. And a wife has this role and actually a duty to God to, to fulfill that, that responsibility, that job that he's given her. It's not your duty to fix it, but just to no, warn. No, just to warn. warn. I'm kind of like, a, uh, you know, like in the, in the Bible days where they had the walls around the city and they would always have a sentry out on the wall to look way in the distance to see if there was a, a marauding army coming and they could see the glint of steel way out there in the distance as the sun hits it and then you run down off the wall and you say there's <laughs> there's an enemy out there coming. there's something coming or how many uh, how many men work in an office let's say and you all go to the office party and there's some secretary or whatever and she's cozying up to your husband the woman knows she can know and sense and feel mm, Something. He's Absolutely. in danger. He's in danger. <laughs> There's something going to affect this relationship. And a man would say, ah, that's nothing. I don't pay attention to her, whatever. But the woman just knows that he might not be, but that secretary or that worker has mm, got, got other plans, intentions. got bad intentions. So the, the azar, the revealer of the enemy, is to help preserve the peace and the sanctity of the marriage. Yes. I'm just checking. We're all, we got 10 minutes. We're good. Okay. And we're a gauge of the relational position of the marriage. We, we gauge it mm -hmm. because we're always seeing, like I said before, the relationships. Yeah. And so I'm trying to tell him, you know, what that is. But um, yes, it is a curse if a man is living in the, the Satan's, uh, when he fiddle faddled with the TV or whatever, yeah. Yeah. and that you have to go Change back. Change the original to, uh -oh. setting. You have to go back to uh, the original setting. And I have to be what God created to me, me to be honestly. And I wasn't honest because I wanted so much to be valued and accepted that I tried to rearrange myself and be everything he wanted me to be. And that's the, all those books I keep telling you about, you know, wrap yourself in plastic and meet him at the door naked or whatever. And uh, I tried to be everything he wanted me to be and it wasn't honest. I wasn't revealing honestly. And I mean, yes, I had to learn to be Christ-like in my revealing mm -hmm. instead of, well, he made me move from quiet and pleasant I, I to- I created a monster by not <laughs> listening way to out you. There. So, <laughs> and I can't manipulate and control the, the effect because I'm always affected, because there was many times I always said, well, that's it, I'm just not, I'm just not talking to him, I'm just gonna ignore gonna him. You're gonna stop revealing I'm just gonna stop <laughs> revealing, I'm gonna ignore him. Well, I'm affected. I mean, and if he was paying attention to my countenance and my inner self and my behavior, he would see, yeah, there's something going on there, 
but he would never inquire because he didn't want to know what was going on there. But I cannot stop myself from being affected. No one can. When you say you're not okay, when you say I'm not going to be affected, you are affected. I mean, that's just the way that God made it. And I want to say that I'm not my husband's enemy, and he always he always viewed me as his enemy, like I was after him and I was uh, making his life miserable. I'm, I wasn't his enemy, but I was the enemy of his flesh. Because when he was in the flesh, it had an effect on me. And Negatively. A negative that. effect on me, and he should have been able to have seen it on my face or within my person or at least heard my words. I saw your face. I just didn't know what it meant. Right. I thought, she's got a problem, but I guess she'll get over it. You know, that's <laughs> kind of what I was thinking. So, it, I, you know, as we go on through this journey here, we ha we'll come back and revisit these areas, but it was a curse to the woman to be ruled over because in the world you can see she's ruled from a flesh perspective, which is not anything that God intended for the woman to suffer under. And that every woman, no matter whether she's converted or not converted, is a revealer of the enemy. But either the man is going to listen or he's not going to listen, and he's going to inquire to find out what, what it is, is it that's going on, because my area of expertise, oops, sorry, I'm banging my thing here. Uh, my area of expertise was relationships, like all of us women are experts in the area of relationships. And, in, and Satan's after us. You can see how that is in the world. It's the woman that is damaged so terribly in wars and in fightings and in, in religion, in religion, period. Crushed. But, they're crushed Defeated. and uh, silenced, and they're silent. They're sitting in churches with duct tape on their mouth, basically. Um, but I, I just wanted to make that clear. The woman is not the enemy of the man, and the rule is just like Christ would rule with kindness and uh, like a shepherd with the with the crook, you know, mm -hmm. to keep the sheep in a uh, a nice field. And I want to remind what's the scripture about when. Um, they're looking for a deacon or an elder, and they would look for a man who could rule his wife, uh, and that she would be a quiet and meek spirit. Well, I always took that to mean that Tape she was she was something <laughs> seriously opposite of what I was, and so I struggled to be this quiet and meek spirit. Well, I wasn't a quiet and meek spirit, and I felt I beat myself up for years over that trying to be this quiet and meek spirit. And really, what it's talking about was that God could look at a man that, or he's looking for a man to shepherd people. And what you would look at would be the wife and the family. Was, was she not quiet How and meek? How is she being shepherded? How is she being yeah. shepherded? Quiet and meek didn't mean, you know, tape over her mouth. Quiet and meek, meek meant she's at peace. Like a one little sheep in this field is at peace. And, and is dwelling peacefully and confidently in the, and that one little sheep can eat its grass and not be fearful that the wolf was lurking around the fence. And so that God could, that people and God could look at that one little sheep and know that that man could shepherd more sheep. And, I, but the quiet and meek spirit business is, you well, know. Well, we read that as keep them in line, keep them shut down. Right. Stay in the kitchen, serve cookies. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have any real value of anything. Right. And I just want to finish this uh, with a, two quotes about leadership because, I mean, that's really what this is about, is about men leading. Like, like I said, I really, I'm really not a fan of the word rule. It just sounds terrible, like dominating. <coughs> yeah. but rule just means to govern or shepherd. Right. I mean, we think of rule as the harsh rule instead of, the Christ-like rule. Right. Nothing wrong with ruling. It's just making sure you're ruling properly. But what happens? What happens is when you grow up in a society. I mean, we all pop up. I popped up in 1947. The world was already going, and the rest. Some of you are popping up later in life. Well, the story is already going, and words have changed. Mm -hmm. And so we look at words differently than they were intended to be. That's mm -hmm. why you have to look them up and find out. Well, what did God actually intend with this word? That's why, to me, mm -hmm. the word rule is like a hideous sounding <laughs> thing. Yeah, sounds so negative. In, from my perspective in the era I'm living in. Leadership is not a rank or position. Leadership is a service to be given. And leading is not the same as being a leader. 
Being a leader means others are willing to follow, not because they have to, but because they want to. And I was following his headship, his leading, because I had to, not because I wanted to. And, it, and in the last 20 years, I follow because I want to, because I'm being listened to, because he actually now values my role, that I actually have a role that God gave me to implement in this relationship. And uh, so following comes because I, I respect what he, what he says and what, how he has been treating me. So he's broken the curse in our relationship. He's, he's going back to the initial intent that God had for the apparat apparatus here. To be God-centered. To be God-centered. Not flesh-centered. Right. And that's all I have to say about this. But Izar is revealer of the enemy, and that's what the word help me means, not I'm going to wash mm. dishes and do laundry and those types of things, which is most, I mean, I do those. <laughs> that's not my role. So that's all I have to say on the subject. Well, my biggest problem with, with you being the revealer is I didn't understand the benefit. I didn't yeah. understand God's plan. If I would have known or been instructed properly that I needed to listen to my wife because it was a blessing from God for her to be here because she's the one who's going to reveal to me anything that's going to, it's, it's a threat to, to, our, to our family or to our relationship. And so instead of looking at her as a blessing, I looked at her as an enemy. Well, the other thing was I was also a revealer in business. Yeah. I was a revealer in finances. I was a, a revealer, um, I had it in my brain and it just flipped out yeah. of there, but uh, in other things other mm -hmm. than relationships, mm -hmm. I had a sense and a feeling that something wasn't right or that person you're gonna do business with I don't feel good about yeah. that. I just don't feel Woman's good about intuition. it. I had gut feelings and intuitions, and 90% of the time it, I was accurate and to the demise of, or, or I have an example. I've, I've known men uh, who didn't listen to their wives, and they actually were very ob obnoxious to be around, and no one wanted to be around them. So that, so, and the wife was completely shut down. There was no way she was going to touch his arm and, and have him pay attention to what she was going to say. And hence, we all had to put up with the obnoxiousness. And the sad part of it was, is the man ended up with no one liking him, no one wanting to be around him. So that was not a good thing. The better thing would have been if she could have said, honey, yeah, you know, <laughs> you need to do something or pay attention to this. Or sometimes we'll be in a group of people and I know I know the stories of the people, and I can see he's headed into an arena that might be offensive to somebody at my table or whatever, and I can see him going there, and I'll either kick him, I'm kicking him onto the <laughs> table, or putting my hand on his arm, which yeah. to hit us now is a signal Before, that- Before, it used to just annoy me when she, she would, did that, but now I realize when she's, she's doing that- trying to hey, tell him something. Stop, look, and listen. <laughs> So that's all, that's how the revealer works because we're relational, so we're looking at faces, we're, we're perceiving feelings out there, and we're knowing stories. And so we don't want, I don't want, I don't want anyone to come to his funeral and spit on his grave. I don't want my kids to spit on his grave and hate him because he stomped all over everybody unbeknownst to himself in his flesh. I'm, you know, trying to be the, the, the battle ax behind the head because I see. Mm -hmm. And that's what that word means. Yeah. So, much fuller than, yeah, she's just a helper suitable. <laughs> <laughs> They're much more entailed. Mm -hmm. Well, that covers what we were going to discuss today. Um, Next time, we're going to cover submission, submission and respect. And respect, which is very, very misused and misapplied a lot of times, so we'll clear that up.